What's good, my dear language learning master? And welcome to Natural Languages and to a new episode of the Language Import Podcast. And in today's interview, I'm going to talk with Terry. And she's American, and she's going to tell us about her experience teaching French there in, in her native country. And she's, she's also going to tell us about how some of, their, some of her students went from hating it to loving it. When, when she decided to switch from traditional methods to comprehensive input ideas, you know, and storytelling and things of that nature. And it's, it's just amazing that the experiences that she's going to talk about, because it, it was like such a big change in the life of those students that I think is, is worth listening to. Yeah. And yeah, with that being said, let's, let's get right into it. And I really hope you enjoy it as, as much as I did. And yeah, let's go. And as usual, any comment, any question, anything that you want to tell us about, just go to the comment section below or whatever, you know, whatever you're, you're going, you're, you're listening to this. And yeah, let us know because we'll be more than happy to answer your questions, to help you out as much as we can, or just anything related to language learning. We're here to help you out. So let's let, let's get right into it. Let's go. So hi Terry. Hi Alvaro. And uh, good to see you. Yeah, yeah, good to see you again, and welcome to the podcast. It's I'm really happy to have you. Thank you. It's happy. I'm very happy to be here. All right, and well, first of all, as usual, just tell us a little bit about yourself, especially when it comes to to language uh, learning and teaching, both of them, like your experience with languages. Well. My name is Terry Weekert, and I was a French teacher for 35 years. I started learning uh, French when I was 17 or 18 years old, and, and I loved it, and I just kept trying and trying. It was difficult, but I knew that someday I wanted to visit, maybe even live in France, so I just kept after it and kept after it and went to college and studied French there. It's a lot of grammar, yeah. a lot of memorizing vocabulary, and I was just not that good at it. I tried, I tried, and I, I just never gave up. I wanted to go to France, so when I was a senior in college, when I was about 21 years old, I, I was able finally to make it a year study in France, yeah. and um, again, I had professors who said, you know, it's okay if you don't want to study French anymore. And I thought, why would they say that? And it's because I just could not master the grammar, could not get the vocabulary. So I went to live, I lived in Strasbourg for a year, went to the university, took some classes at a specialized school for uh, foreigners who came to Strasbourg to learn French. And again, it was a lot of grammar, a lot of vocabulary. And I discovered that I learned a whole lot more when I was just out sitting, having a cup of coffee, a glass of wine with the locals. And I got to know several of the local students at the university. And that's really where I learned how to speak French. Um, so I went home and, and it was time to graduate and find a job. And I wasn't going to teach French. I just wanted to learn French for fun. But that was the job I was offered. So I taught French and history and geography and sociology. And I had a whole huge plate of things, lots and lots of things that I had to teach. And as I taught French, I learned more French. Right. But I taught the way I had been taught, and my students weren't any better at it than I was. <laughs> they couldn't remember the grammar. They couldn't remember the vocabulary. They didn't understand when they heard it. And it was kind of frustrating for a very long time. And I searched and I searched for better ways to teach French so that when they walked out of the room, at least they could understand some of what uh, they had heard. So after... This was 25 years of teaching that way and feeling that frustration. Mm -hmm. I stumbled upon a workshop 
for TPRS. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll try it, see what it, see how it works. And within an hour, I thought, okay, this is it. I found it. I found the way I have needed to teach for all of these years. So I went back, it was a two-day workshop. I read everything I could. There wasn't much at the time. This was in 1999. There were not very many books. There was no curriculum or very little curriculum, especially in French. Most of it was in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I figured out how to do it and I fumbled and I stumbled and, and my students loved it. Mm -hmm. And they were learning. They were learning more French than they had ever learned in the past. And students that had had me the year before that just absolutely hated the class, loved it. They came in happy every day and excited that because I think it was the success and they were feeling like they could understand French and they could speak French. Exactly. So that was in 1999 and I just kept learning and growing and I would go to conferences and there would be nothing, nobody to help me. And I thought, okay, I'll be the one that teaches everybody. So I learned enough how to do it and I started very small and started training teachers how to do TPRS. And then it expanded into lots more of what Stephen Krashen has talked about with comprehensible input. And then have learned an awful lot about acquisition, second language acquisition, and figuring out how to put those theories into reality in a classroom. So I kept teaching and then it came time for me to retire and I retired in 2010. And since then I have been actively involved in all of the major conferences that there have been in acquisition uh, and TPRS. And TPRS first, then IFLT, and then going to the Aja workshop and working with Judith. Uh, so now my current job is to put together the IFLT conference for next summer, which we're going to try to do it in person. We're being very positive that life will be calmed down enough and enough people will be vaccinated and we'll be able to host the conference. We're going to be in Michigan. And so what we're working on right now is getting the, the team together and how to put together the training and we're so excited to be back together again, uh, to actually see one another. We did it on Zoom last summer and it worked. Uh, you can do it. it yeah. we just, you know, you miss, you miss being near people, you miss hugs and you miss seeing the smiles on their faces. So we're really, really optimistic that we're gonna be able to do that this year. So that has been my experience and I love training teachers in this. I just, that's because I know we can reach so many more students. Exactly. I saw how my students changed and I just know we can, can continue to change the world. It's just really what I'm thinking. Yeah, because when, when you train a new teacher, that's potentially, I don't know how many more new students that you're gonna impact, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think too, with, with teachers, I've heard this from so many and it was true for me. It saved my career. Mm. I was just really frustrated and thought, I don't want to do this anymore. And it, it just transformed everything in my classroom because it, oh. students started liking it and they started getting successful. And so it made my life easier when you see the success of your students. So that's why I really like training sure people. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, yeah, I wanna get back to that story you talked about that your students hating French the day, the, the year before and then loving it. It was, it was Judith in, in the interview with her that she told me about an American boy who came to France in an exchange program that she, she was amazed at how much uh, he could communicate in French. And her, her first thought was to think that he was like a brilliant student and, you know, <laughs> kind of the, the, the same ideas that we have, you know, when we look at someone that way. And the funny thing is she was told that boy failed at everything but French. <laughs> 
it just there's so exactly. much like that. Yeah. Yep. It is. It's so effective, and and so encouraging. It makes you want to keep trying. And even yeah. if you don't do it very well at the beginning, that's all right. You'll get better. Yeah, and you're because for students, they they get to talk about things they're interested in. They mm -hmm. you know they get to create story, co create stories or whatever it is. And they they can see that they they understand what they're listening to, and they they start being able to communicate little by little. So it just it's game changing again. It, was crazy. it is, yeah. and you experience that yourself too. Oh, <laughs> absolutely! Like I, I've talked about it several times, but I don't know the way it looks in other countries. But in Spain, I. Well, pretty much I, I studied English for 15 years throughout uh, primary school, high school, and college. And I could pass pretty much any grammar exam, but I just couldn't speak language. <laughs> Simple <Yeah>. as that. <laughs> like, I, I couldn't. And I actually remember, like, trying to talk with Erasmus students, like, exchange students in Spain who came from other countries. I couldn't, I, you know, I wasn't able to just communicate. Mm -hmm. And I was passing exams, you know, not, not with crazy grades because I didn't like the, the process of memorizing and so on, but just good enough to, to, to get passing grades and so on. But I just couldn't speak the language. And then when I started, I'm just, yeah, I want to ask you about, I'm going to talk about my experience. Like I'm, I'm just so passionate about languages that I just, I stuck with it and I kept trying. But, you know, the thing is, I think it, because of the traditional grammar approach that's so dominant all over the world, there's so many people who've given up on languages because of it. Exactly. It just, it breaks my heart because, I mean, I wouldn't say I was close to it because, again, I'm just super passionate about it. It's something that I love, like learning new languages and getting to know about different cultures, traveling and all that. Mm -hmm. So I start with it, like I said, but it wasn't until 2016, like I said, I started um, reading Stephen Krashen's books and watching videos. And then when I went to the conference in France that I realized, OK, wait a minute. So I actually what truly helped me learn English was watching the NBA. <laughs> because I, I was interested in the game, obviously. Right. And I mean, the, the one thing after those 15 years, I, I knew a little bit of the language, like just enough to understand what was going on. So it's not that it was completely useless, but you know, in 15 years, you would expect something more than that. <laughs> you would hope to be able to carry on a conversation. Exactly. But it was enough for me to understand what was going on. And I, I just loved it. And I still love it so much, watching the NBA in English. Mm -hmm. I was getting tons and tons of comprehensive input, like yeah. so, so much time. <laughs> and yeah, I realized a few, few years later that that was the thing that actually helped me. And again, many times people learning another language or students, because they're, they're getting grammar, traditional so grammar classes and at the same time they're watching series or they're listening to their favorite music artists because we adults believe the traditional I mean most people believe the traditional grammar approach is the way to teach a second language we give that the credit for our improvement when actually what's helping you out is listening to your favorite music or reading comics or things that you're doing to exactly. enjoy them and that happened to be in your target language, so you're actually acquiring the language that way. Yeah. Right. And as Stephen Krashen has noted, you get so wrapped up in the message, you forget that it's in another language. You do. And, and that acquisition starts creeping into the into that brain. And and yeah, all of a sudden it's like, well, where did I learn that? How do I know that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's like listening to languages that just a I, I was going to say, you know, like six months before, this, they, they were just pure noise to you. <laughs> and then you start to sort of understand what's going on. Even, even if they're just cartoons or comic books, like simple things. Right? It's an amazing feeling. And Yes, yes. 
Yeah. And that's why you're doing what you're doing and I'm doing what I'm doing is that we yeah. want more and more people to experience that joy exactly. of being able to understand and being able to communicate yeah. in, in another language. Yeah, and then you understand that input is the key to the entire process. So you're not exactly. you're not in a hurry to start communicating. Not because you don't want to, because you know your ultimate goal is to be able to communicate, right? But right. you understand that yes, as it happens with kids and the native language, you just need more comprehensible input and more time. Exactly. And it's exactly. gonna come to you naturally, right? And I think the more of us who, who watch young children and their language emerging and how much they can comprehend long before they can speak. Oh, yeah. We, that that is, you know, there's so many similarities with the, with the second language. Um, yes, yeah, I was going to ask you because I, I was thinking that when you started studying French, you said it was all grammar and you didn't enjoy it particularly, right? <laughs> Not much. But was what were you so passionate about it, or did you love it so much that you just kept trying? Or was do you have any moments in which you were like, eh, I, I'm just gonna give up? You know, I don't ever think I, I was ready to give up. Uh -huh. uh, amazingly, because um, I just wanted to go to France and speak to people. Mm -hmm. and wanted to communicate and and I thought I'll just keep trying it must be me um mm -hmm. must be some I'm just not good at languages but I'm going to keep trying because that's what I want to do um there were times when I was teaching that I wanted to quit teaching mm -hmm. because I did not feel effective because I was still teaching history and geography and sociology and and I I knew what I was doing there and I was effective and so, you know, I, that I wanted to give up on, but I never wanted to give up on French. I still take French lessons. Mm -hmm. I do online French lessons um, throughout, the, throughout the fall. Right. With, with uh, who you know, Sabrina, who does yeah. a, a fabulous I, job. I, I had her on the podcast, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> like two episodes ago, yeah. <laughs> yep. And, and so even now, after all of these years, it, it's, it's, been, it, it's been nearly 53 years ago that I started learning French. And I'm not finished yet. I still want to learn and get better at it. Um, and I've worked on my Spanish as well because I work with so many Spanish teachers that, that my Spanish is better. Yeah, and Spanish-speaking people in your community, I guess, as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Lots, lots. There are a lot of Spanish-speaking mm -hmm. uh, Americans. Yeah, but it's, it's it's so important what you said that you said, "Oh, it must be me." That's, I mean, that, that's something that I think I, I'm just gonna make up a number, but like a, a huge percentage of people think that they just not good at languages because they just. Not because they're not good at languages, we, we know that already, right? But because right. for whatever reason, the, the process of memorizing or studying the traditional way just doesn't work for them. Or, it's, or, yeah. or it might work somehow, but they're just not enjoying the process. Mm -hmm. And even if they sort of get decent grades, they can communicate, right? Because not because of them, but because that's not the way the language mechanism works. Right. So sooner or later you're going to start thinking that it's your fault that there's something wrong with you that mm -hmm. you're, not, you're just not talented at languages and yet again it's another reason why so many people are giving up right when right. they when they shouldn't i mean when i say they shouldn't i perfectly understand why they want to give up like right i, right. Felt, I felt that myself <laughs> we just need to get more and more teachers out there who can show them that it can be done at any age there's not an age at which you can no longer learn languages. Yeah. So maybe you won't have perfect pronunciation, but you know right. you can still learn enough to communicate, be effective. And you learn so much more than just language, learning other people's culture, how they live, how they think, why they think the way they do. It just, learning another language opens huge, huge worlds yeah. to people. 
And, and like you, I'm, I'm so passionate about opening the world to, to as many people as we can. Right. Because, yeah, I, I just, I, I always say that I really wish people could be in my head just for a minute <laughs> and, and I really, really grasp or understand the difference between my mindset when I didn't know how the process worked and my mindset now. Like, mm -hmm. again, it was just like desperation. Like, I just, I'm not going to learn the language. So I'm, like you said, it must be me or I'm not good at languages. And the, the joy, the pleasure I feel every single day right now, it's just crazy. And, and back to the, the age thing that you were talking about. I remember a couple of years ago, I had a student for a while. He was 88. He was a pastor in Canada. <laughs> and he started learning Spanish for the first time because he wanted to go to Cuba. Uh-huh. So it was, that, that made me think a lot. So come on, like 88, you know, he certainly doesn't need to. <laughs> and he was as passionate as anyone about it. And mm -hmm. I keep talking about it. Like, it's not, actually, I I was talking about this with Brian. Do you remember Brian from South Africa? I do. Yeah. So we were talking about the fact that it's not that, you can't learn a second language after a certain age is that you learn to learn it the wrong way it doesn't make sense <laughs> yeah. right. you get in your head that that's the only way to learn and yeah therefore that's what you think you ought to do exactly or you you learn to consciously control the process which messes up with the whole thing right? <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah you just have to let it happen exactly so i just want to encourage everyone to mm -hmm. This, I mean, do some research on comprehensive input, Stephen Crushing theories, or mm -hmm. start mm -hmm. consuming content, loving it. Because, like you said about your kids, your your students, you know, we're not talking about people who are passionate about languages. We're talking about the same people hating it, and the year late, and a year later, loving it, loving it, and people, yep. right, exactly. And, and the real beauty is, I think back of, of those years that I taught with comprehensible input, I had a number of students who, who were in special programs and had special needs. And they still learn how to speak French. I mean, they didn't have any more trouble than, than any other student that came into the room. Right. Uh, and some of them even more successful because they were enjoying themselves and, exactly. and it works. It works for virtually everyone. If you learn how to speak one language, you can learn how to speak another one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, and it's it is it's a process that works for every single one of us when we were kids. Mm -hmm. right? So exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Do you have any any specific story? Like a, a specific kid? Like I mean, you're talking about the whole class overall. But like a specific kid that you remember was having a lot of trouble or just hated it so much. And all of the sudden, it was just, oh, my goodness. Well, this this was the very first year that, well, the year before I taught with comprehensible input, he was a uh, trouble. He hated the class. Mm -hmm. He wanted to blurt, talk. He was mean. He was just miserable. And he took it out on everybody. Mm -hmm. And then he came back the next year. And about two months into the school year, his mother came to visit for parent-teacher conferences. And she said, what are you doing? <laughs> Why? <laughs> because he comes home every night speaking French. He loves it. What did you do? <laughs> goodness what did I do uh, so I explained to her I said I just learned a different way to teach and it's effective and it worked and and you can see it's just not well, it wasn't boring anymore because he wasn't grasping it it was hard and he just he was frustrated and he was angry and and once he was able to succeed and learn the language then he was happy and he enjoyed what he was doing. 
right. he, he was still a bit of a troublemaker, but <laughs> he was a whole lot better than he had been before. And then another one, this was uh, towards the end when I was, it may have been the last year I was teaching. He was uh, special needs and, and he, was, he struggled in, in a lot, a lot of subjects. But he did really well in French because he could be up. He was, he was always volunteering to be my actor because he liked to do that. Um, he did well on the exams. He, he just succeeded. And about two years later, I ran into him. I, I was out and he was working. And I approached him and started speaking French to him. And he said, I don't remember anything. Oh, okay. I continued to speak French. I told him what I wanted to buy. He walked over, he got it. I gave him the money and, and we, I continued to speak French and he was just amazed that after two years, he still understood what I was saying. Right. And I, I said, see, it's, it's in there, it's in the brain. And even though for two years he hadn't used French at all, I hadn't thought about French. As soon as I started speaking to him, no, slowly and with comprehensible language, it was right back as if he were back in the classroom. Right. So that's the other beauty of language acquisition. Once it's there, it's there. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. He, he probably had the feeling of not remember not remembering anything because he couldn't actually speak the language. Right. Exactly. We get back to the the wrong idea of output being the key to improvement, which is not, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there's a lot, a lot of language in the head um, that is enabled. You know, I, I had mentioned my, my grandson, who was almost two. His language comprehension is thousands of words, complex phrases. Yeah. And yet he only speaks simple words. But he communicates, he uses sign language, mm -hmm. and he communicates, there is no question that he understands what we're saying to him. And the only word he doesn't comprehend is no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that doesn't stop him. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah just make your point across yeah. and keep getting comprehensible input. That's, mm -hmm. that's all you yeah. need. Yeah. But, <laughs> And that's it. And the output will come when the time is, is right. Um, the output will come. Yeah, as a result, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but <clears throat> like the, those, those two examples that you mentioned, it's just, it's amazing. But yeah, I, I want people to know that, I mean, it, it's probably more mind blowing when it comes to kids because you see the like the two extremes, like hating it to loving it, right? But mm -hmm. When it comes to adults, probably minus the part about travel, travel making travel and so on, because <laughs> we don't have those issues. But right. as adult, as an adult, you can pretty much go from hating it to loving it, mm -hmm. just switching the, the way you go about it. Right? Yeah, just uh, enjoying content that you're interested in, as opposed to trying to memorize lists and consistent learning grammar rules and, and so exactly. on. Exactly. It just makes all that's, the sense. <laughs> that's a whole big part of, of teaching the way we teach is that you find something students are going to be interested in and, and then talk about that mm. because, you know, who cares what you talk about? If they're interested in their hearing the language, then, then they'll pay attention and they'll acquire it. Yeah. And that kid, as, as much travel as he was making, I'm sure... They're, they're all interested in something. So right. whether that's sports or influencers right now or whatever it is, if you, right. if you start talking about it, they're just going to be interested in it. And Exactly. Like you in basketball. All right. <laughs> you, find out, you find that one thing and then, and then you do it. I know a lot of people do it with books or movies. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's... That makes it fun. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I'm, I'm obsessed with finding things that <laughs> that are that are interesting to me and that I can consume in another language. So I keep having a lot of fun and learning another language, right? So, 
of course, the, the, the higher your level, the easier it's going to be for you to find resources that you're truly interested in. Because, exactly. you know, it's a series more times than not is going to be more interesting than a cartoon, right? For, for me as an adult. Right. <laughs> right. But still, I, I look at cartoons as a sort of transition resource that's going to be, that's going to give me access to a more complex and interesting resource. So. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I don't have problems with it. I, I'm patient and I know I'm going to get there. But right. the moment you you realize you can keep getting comprehensible input and keep getting better while you're listening to podcasts about yeah, sports, like I said, or I'm interested right. in philosophy, so I'm just going to start uh, listening to a podcast in Portuguese that talks about philosophy. That's an example that I'm using, by the way. Right, right. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah, it's just... The other good thing to find is a sympathetic language partner. Mm. Somebody who's, who's a native speaker, who's very, very patient right. and will just let you fumble and stumble. Mm -hmm. and that way, you know, if you can, if you can do that and find somebody who's willing to do that and give you the comprehensible input, right? That really builds up your confidence. Yeah, I think in that sense, I think the sort of crosstalk language to change is particularly interesting mm -hmm. because so too. because both. I mean, for those who don't know, it's just a language exchange in which both participants speak their native language throughout mm -hmm. the whole conversation, right? So if if I went to learn English and you went to learn Spanish, I would speak Spanish all the time and you would English. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about that is, yeah, you, you need a patient person on the other side, but right. he, he or she is going to suffer the same things that you are going through. <laughs> so so it's going to be easier for the other person to adjust, right? Because exactly. you just pick up a native speaker and he or she is the only one helping you, yeah, it takes it takes more patient, <laughs> more patient. <Yeah. laughs> it does because well, this was another experience I had with with a woman that I another teacher that I had known quite well, and we were we did a lot of things together. She was from Quebec mm. and spoke uh, Quebecois, which is slightly different French. Mm -hmm. And I would try to respond to her, and I would fumble and stumble, and she would switch into English. And finally, I said, no, I understand you. I know exactly what you're saying. You just keep speaking French to me and I will respond to you as best I can in French or I'll throw in English words. Mm -hmm. but don't switch back to English. OK, so we did that and we were, we were at a conference together and we spent the week together. And by the end of the week, it was so much easier for me to speak French because I, it took away, as Stephen Krashen talks about, the affective filter. I was no longer worried that I was making mistakes and that I always had to speak French. Correct. So by my speaking that fractured French, eventually I got calm and comfortable enough and, and I had the whole week of listening to her speak French. Right. Yeah. So... If, if you can find situations like that where you can be immersed in the language with somebody who is, like I said, sympathetic and patient and willing to let you do it and not switch immediately to English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the Your native language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've done the cross talk thing with several languages, and especially at the beginning when with languages like Italian and Portuguese, for example, that I can I could understand a lot of already because of the similarities with Spanish as well, but I just couldn't speak the language yet. And the other person was in a similar situation, just, just wanting to learn Spanish. So to take Portuguese as an, as an example, for instance, so I started talking with, with a girl from Brazil. So we just I would just speak Spanish all the time and she would speak Portuguese all the time. And back to your point about the effective filter, because you need comprehensible input to get better. But sometimes if you're, if you're really stressed, even though it's input and it should be comprehensible, 
is not because of your stress or and back to your point many times when you're in a real life situation in which you have to reply in your target language and you're not ready for it yet you're not really listening to what the other person's saying because you're trying to think of what you're going to say next and yeah. so yeah and with this crosstalk idea because you're you're using your native language all the time you 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 know you you forget about that pressure of having to communicate in the target language. So you're really paying attention to what the other person's saying, and surprisingly enough, you understand more and more, right? Yeah, it's so surprising how effective that crosstalk idea is. It is. It just it's not it's not very common because again, back to what I was talking about before, that most people think you need to talk in order to get better. Right. Right. Most people think output is is um, is the this. I mean, is the key to your improvement when it's not. It's just it just shows how much input you got. Right. It's like right. You, you get better by getting comprehensible input, and then output shows up as a result. So because of that, most people want to try. They want to communicate. Right. Sure, they do. Exactly. And, I understand be wanting to communicate because again, that's our ultimate goal, right? But I see people keep trying to force the issue a little bit because they still think com uh, trying to communicate or, or, or speaking is going to help them get better. And, you know, in that moment, you start hesitating a lot with speaking. Because you're not, you're just not ready, and you start thinking that you're not good at languages. So right. the whole thing again and again, right? Yeah. But definitely, crosstalk is just super, super useful, mm -hmm. especially at the beginning when you can't really communicate yet in the language, but you can understand a good deal of, of it. And yeah, and because the other person is feeling the same thing he or she's going to be more patient with you. Right, right. <laughs> As they're learning your language. Exactly. Yep. They, they, they knew what it takes from the other person to make it comprehensible for them, so they're going to do the same things. <laughs> Perfect. And is there any other, any other resource that you're using to keep improving your French or your Spanish that you were talking about? Like any source of comprehensible input? I watch movies mm -hmm. and I, um, what is really effective for me is put, putting the French subtitles okay. so that when I hear it, I can also be reading it at the same time. And that has really expanded my vocabulary mm -hmm. because sometimes you hear words and you think you understand, but you don't. But if you can read it, then that has helped my acquisition. So it's it's the blending of, of the listening input and the reading input at the same time that right. has been very effective. And yeah, and tar target language of titles. Yeah, that's key. Yeah. Right. I, I, I started doing something similar with audiobooks. Ah. But I, I try to find the text as well. So I, I mean, I was listening to the audiobook and reading it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, the, I mean, what you said about movies is perfect, but the one thing I've, not that I don't like it, but with movies or series, because there's there's a plot, there's there's something to, to, to follow, and there's an action to follow. I tend to get distracted, that's just me, because <laughs> I, I, I'm paying attention to what's going on, but then trying to read the subtitles at the oh, bottom. Too. Mm -hmm. But it sort of takes my attention away from what's going on, but... <coughs> Excuse me. When it comes to the audiobook, because there's no there's no visual action that I need to follow. Right. I'm right. Just, I'm just reading the book and listening listening. At the same time. Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, also the languages in a in a book, the language in books are more are richer. Mm -hmm. And when you get on movies and series, it's a lot of slang and yeah. a lot of. Uh, you know, just short words here and there, and the language isn't quite as rich. It's enjoyable, but I think you're right with books. Yeah, it's not as rich, but it's more natural at the same time. Well, not natural, but no, not natural, not the word, but more, uh, more of the language that is used in real life, right? Right, 
exactly. So that, you know, it's it's not either or. You can do both. You know, I'm, I'm just talking about my example that with series and, and series, I, I, with series and movies, my attention tends to divide between things. But yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, that's a good. Sure. Actually, Whatever you can do to get input. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, and you enjoy. Yeah, yeah. that's mm -hmm. good. Yeah, I'm actually like I've talked about it and here on my channel. Like I, I'm using board games a lot recently. Ah. I, I use them for teaching, but also when when I when I I want to know how to play a new game, I watch a tutorial in a language that I'm trying to improve on, right? Ah. So that way, there's input all over the place. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I, I want to learn a new game to be able to teach it to my students. So I, I watch a tutorial in Italian, for instance. So I'm getting comprehensive report in Italian about something that I'm interest, interested in and that I'm going to use for my students. Right. And the good thing about board games is, first of all, they're fun, right? So you're, right. and they, they really help you forget about language in, in the way that we were mentioning before that, you're so immersed in in the story or in the in the game because you you want to learn the game and you want to win, right? <laughs> so you're you're really focused on understanding the game and your moves. So it, it really helps you forget about the language that you're actually hearing or using. Mm -hmm. And then also there's you know you're moving pieces around, so it's easier to sort of connect the sounds that you're hearing to with the actual action. That's going right. on, right? So I'm, I'm just going to roll the dice and get a five. It's really easy to see what's going on, right? So there's someone rolling the dice and getting a five. <laughs> then I'm moving this piece over here because I'm planning to attack this, you know, whatever it is. So I'm, like I said, I'm obsessed with ideas like that. That I'm, I'm looking into cooking videos recently. So like, it's not that I'm that much into cooking to be honest <laughs> but <laughs> you know you, you you learn new recipes and back to the back to the same idea you, you get someone so i'm gonna chop the onions right now and you actually see it at the same see time it happening. so it's it's really helpful yeah so. it is it is so yes. well, yeah two years ago i had signed up for a cooking class in oh. france but it was 2020 and oh. everything got canceled. So I still have it. I still plan to take this cooking class in, in French the next time I happen to be there. Okay, but is it in France or just in French in your city? It is in France. Oh. It is in the, in the city of Montpellier, mm -hmm. which is uh, along the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, so I you hope to get there. Okay, so your plan was to go to Ajan to, for the conference and then then, or? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, go spend a week in Montpellier and then go spend a week in Ajan. Cool. Yeah, guys, I mean, it's probably the ideal situation when the input is actually directed at you personally. Right, right. I mean, the, the great thing about the internet is there's so much content. <laughs> yes. In every single language, especially French, English. Oh my, yes. Yeah, you can find just about anything on the internet. Exactly. When there's that's that extra layer when the input is actually directed at you, that mm -hmm. probably a little bit more useful, just a little bit, but. Mm -hmm. And you get to connect with people all over the world. Yeah. And there's always that, the experience, that, that connection, how to put it into words that mm, that you tend to remember things in a better way when you when there's that emotional connection exactly people and with the with the situation the story yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like I'm sure your first trip to France you still remember a lot of things that you learned because of it like that was a remember. long long time ago <laughs> yes I do yeah I do but, remember yeah like but still like I, I don't know where, where it was but you know, that first time I went to Paris and I went to this uh, bakery, asked for, I I'm sure it's, it's still there, right? Because it's that emotional connection with it. Yep, exactly, exactly. But I have you remember the experience itself and the language used it. And the language, mm -hmm. yep. Cool. So if, and if you, 
if you were to start a new language from scratch, what what would you do? Or how, how would you go about it? Well, I'd have to find somebody who knows about comprehensible input. That's absolute. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think I would just do the crosstalk. That would be where I'd start. Right. And yeah, like, is there any language that you're interested in or you look into? I, I would like to learn Italian. Okay. My mother, uh, my mother's family was Italian mm. and she was only, she was first generation American. Okay. So most of the people who spoke Italian are no longer with us, but I have always wanted to learn it. Right. So. And yeah, so you were starting from scratch, but because of your French, you probably right. it's, it's not totally from scratch because it's it's enough there's enough like french there's a little italian right, right. Uh, or a little in the spanish and um my parents spoke italian at home to each other mm. it was it was their secret secret language <laughs> so some of those words are still implanted in my brain right right yeah so that, in that case you could go right a, right away with crust you know Mm -hmm. I think so. As opposed to wanting to learn, I don't know, Japanese, for example. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, that case, you probably need a teacher, right? That I would need a teacher for, exactly. When, it, when it's that different from everything that I've ever known before. Yeah. Japanese, Chinese, Arabic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the good thing is, there, like, uh, by, by the minute, there's more and more projects online of teachers. Right. Creating videos, creating content to help. Even I mean, it's always harder when 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 you're trying to create videos for total beginners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, be, also because you're not getting live feedback, that is so helpful. Exactly, but, exactly. But still, you know, there, there are videos out there for Japanese, uh, Mandarin oh, for TV. everything. But also with the pandemic, we have really become very versatile with zoom mm. or skype and teaching online so you can find classes oh yeah, class. yeah. as you do you can find live teachers who absolutely who replicate that feeling of being in a classroom yeah because we you know we have all sorts of tools and like you said now we're all more <laughs> more advanced when it comes to our skills <laughs> right exactly but exactly sorts of sharing screen tools and whiteboards that you can use. Mm, right. so, yeah, and actually the, the board games that I was talking about, I use online platforms that you can actually play the games and it's ah. helpful, yeah. Sure. So I, I don't need to set up the physical game. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, all right. When, anything else about your journey that, you want to mention? Not that I think of. This has been great. This okay. has been fun talking about language acquisition and okay. hearing what your journey is. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoy this format because, again, I keep talking about it that we all believe in the same idea, but we all have different um, resources that we use for our own language journey, different nuances. and. I'm 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 just learning so many things every single conversation that I'm having. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, like uh, little things that these people use that I didn't think of. Mm -hmm. well. uh, mm, I can use that in my classes as a language teacher, but also to continue to learn other languages, which I love still. Right. Well, I look forward to to watching your your other podcasts with with the other people that I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm reaching out to a lot of people from Ajang. Mm -hmm. They all use comprehensible input and they all have their, their own journeys and new languages. Because I, I had Diane, for example, so she's, you know, she's gonna be able to share her ideas when it comes to a totally different language. Exactly. I've been Mandarin Chinese, mm -hmm. learning a different alphabet, how to go about learning Chinese characters and things of that nature. Right. And you're talking to a lot of us who are non-native speakers of the language we're teaching. Correct. And that's a different, different perspective than mm -hmm. if you're teaching your native language. Right. Right, because I've, 
I when, when I started with my project, I used to teach English as well to Spanish speaking people mostly. And I still do it every now and then, but I've, I've, I've seen that I'm, I enjoy using, I'm, I enjoy teaching my native language a little bit more than other languages. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I, I get to talk about our culture as well, I guess, or I don't know. Also because in Spanish, I can always find a way around, right? With English, I, I can for, I don't know, 98% of the time, but there's, there's always some some specific phrases or structures that, uh, you know, I, I know how to tell how to say them in English. I, I'm going to use the way that sounds natural to me, but at the same time, I know they might not understand it if I use it that way. Mm -hmm. And most times I can find a way around it, but with Spanish, I can always find a way around it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, I don't know, like, it, 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 as opposed to saying to keep on trying, for example, when it's keep or keep on, what I know if, if I use the verb continue, they're going to understand. Mm -hmm. Continuar in Spanish, right? But, it, but my first initial reaction is to use keep on trying, for example, because that's more natural in that specific right. sentence, right? But in that case, I can find a way around it. But in mm -hmm. other cases, eh, it might take you. It might take me more time. <laughs> might take time. Yeah. But with my native language, I can always find a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The last thing I just uh, remember. So your your conference or the the conference that you're organizing in Michigan. Mm -hmm. When when's that? And can people sign yes. for it? Or July eleventh to the fifteenth. Okay. And you can go to the fluencymatters.com website all right. and all the information is there and the link to register. Perfect. Yeah, I'll leave the link below. All right. And that's, is it only for language teachers who want to learn how to teach this way or is it also open for students of a specific language or? It is also, we have, uh, it's mainly for training teachers mm -hmm. how to teach the way we teach. But in order to do that, we have languages that you can watch teachers. So if you want to learn the language, uh, right now we have Spanish, French, and Mandarin. And the French class is going to be, so far, it's going to be online. It's French for French teachers. So it's an advanced French class, and it will be taught by uh, Sabrina mm -hmm. Seban Jancic, and she's going to be teaching online. So it's it's for French teachers, and we can have or advanced speakers of French. Right. So anybody who wants to do that. But we'll also have in person a beginning Spanish, an intermediate Spanish, and a beginning Mandarin. So anybody who wants to come and be a student, they can come and do that. They can come and be a teacher the rest of the day and be a student during that, that hour and a half. Um, right. and so it should be a lot of fun. We have a lot of social activities planned too because we wanna get back together again. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So yeah, I'll leave the link below, like I said, and so people can check it out themselves. Okay, thank you. Perfect. I appreciate that. So, well, so thank you again, Terry. It was... You're welcome. This has been great fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying this format so much. And so I'm, I'm going to keep doing it. Okay. Well, good. I, I look forward to seeing who else you have to talk to. Yeah. I'm, I'm learning so much. Like I said, I think it's really helping people. So, yeah, I will continue to spread the word. <laughs> great. As much as I can. Good. That's what we can do. Exactly. So yeah, thank you again. It was it was welcome talking to you again. And yeah, I'll hope to see you this summer. We'll see you soon. Yeah. Bye, Terry. Bye.